Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to another episode, episode three, uh, I think we're on now, uh, of the Divorce Coaching Podcast with myself, Tom Nash from Million Minds or at Mr. Divorce Coach UK on Instagram, and my partner in crime, Faye Petcher. Um, Faye, you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here again, Tom, for podcast number three. We seem to be zipping through them now, so that's good. And if you're all listening, again, feel free to get back to us with any questions. You know, the topic today is um, our mental health, isn't it? After separation and divorce, how it impacts us, mine and Tom's experiences around what happened to us and some of the things that you may encounter, you know, in the weeks and months after, even years sometimes after a separation and divorce. So I'm really interested, Thomas, to know, you know, when you went through your separation and divorce, what sort of things cropped up for you how did you handle them and I think it's really nice to start with you Tom being being a man obviously we had International Men's Day um, last week um, and we were talking about how men just don't open up they don't talk they don't access help Um, so I'm really interested to know what what you struggled with uh always well where to start uh, again I suppose um I think kind of before I kind of get to what transpired in kind of a, I suppose from a mental health uh, well-being perspective is kind of the lead up to that, isn't it? It's the situations and the experiences that lead up to that. And for me, like for most people, I imagine, um, and experience and seeing clients, it's all around that kind of roller coaster emotions that we're going through. So being angry, being resentful, feelings of shame, guilt, whatever, confusion uh, and fears um, that then will kind of impact it. Um, I know we were both talking earlier, weren't we, just before we started recording around talking about some of our own experiences. And I actually had, I actually had a, a panic attack at, at work. This is actually before I had the conversation um, around having separation and, and getting divorced. Um, again, it was a build up from all of these things, both mindset wise and emotionally, as well as what was impacting me. Physically, um, I know you read my article recently um, on the group hug about let's talk men from the pandemic, and it is all around men not talking, like to say. Mm. And at the time, I wasn't, and it's obviously why I do what I do now to help other people to kind of come out from beneath that stigma um, and to help people to start having those conversations and these difficult conversations. But let's say for me at the time, I, I, I wasn't. So this isn't that we are the gurus, like we've all been there, and it's our experiences that led us. <laughs> now isn't it um but yeah and i had um i used to work in the city uh, and i actually had a, had a panic attack at work and it was a, a combination of fear about i've got to have this conversation um i suppose elements of shame and guilt in there as well that were building up with what was going on outside of my marriage that was leading towards its um its demise i suppose and even forms of anger um, even at myself uh, angry at myself as well and mixing that in with everything else that I was kind of trying to cope with and manage at the time and like in my article and like we will see in the media and uh, where men don't talk I was doing the other things I was drinking too much mm-hmm. going out too much uh, burning the candle at both ends as it were no sleep rubbish diet eating crap if I ate at all um, that all kind of led up to this thing and, and my body just gave up. Um, I got into work at, I can't remember what it was, but sort of eight o'clock in the morning, wherever it was, sat down at my desk and I was just shaking uncontrollably. I didn't know what it was. My breathing started going, at which point I really started panicking and everything. I was just getting really anxious about um, to the point we actually we had to call the paramedics, actually. Some paramedics turned up and they had to take me in the boardroom and then put the sticky things all over me and everything like this. And then, and then got sent home to them. Just, I, I, I collapsed and it was just this shaking mess. Um, and it was, it just, yeah, it was basically a bit of a, a pre breakdown, I suppose. Yeah. Um, that was kind of pre uh, the, the conversation, pre the separation. Um, thereafter, again, it was another. So there's another experience, but still you now a different stage or a different version of some of those emotions that we're talking about, like the anger, the shame, fear, etc. Um, and now this led into things like I, I actually dealt with um, so it comes under kind of separation anxiety, mm-hmm. uh, being away from my two sons. Um, whilst even when I was married, I was more of a weekend dad because I was at work <laughs> during uh, at the early hours to the late hours. Um, 
but I was always a very present father. Uh, and now being away from them, not being able to go in and give them a kiss good night, even if they're already asleep, and things like that used to used to play on me um, when I was away from them. Um, before we'd obviously gone through court processes and whatnot um, to have uh, the, the, the shared child arrangement that we have now. But again, it was a lot of those anxieties that I think if I'd carried on down that path could have led to more severe issues of depression and having those thoughts of, and I've had them, like, the world just be a better, better, better place without me. I'm not sure it would be better if I wasn't here, so I'd do something about it. Um, and really having those really low, low thoughts that, 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 that we can get. Um, and then obviously that comes out in other stresses in work because then I'll start snapping at the wrong people, um, and taking things out on, on, on the wrong people, not having the right conversations with the people I should have been in the right way. Um, and it's just a it's whole kind of build up of things. Um, and weird enough, we were just talking again before we started, and I was talking about a new website that I'm doing the copy for, and part of that was writing the about page. Mm-hmm. That's actually really difficult because it's again, it's kind of like getting all of this out from what was happening before, what happened in the middle to where we are now, and it's still kind of all that that process. And you, even as coaches, you kind of you still go through that, don't you? Even when you're working with your client as well, I recognise it brings up a lot of things for me sometimes mm-hmm. where I can't wait for a session going. Well, well yeah, it's really made me even think now. Um, even still, as good as things are now, so mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's it's can be a really really scary time, and then. Obviously, all the other impacts on that are not just panic attacks, but things like tiredness, lethargic, staying in bed, can't get up. So one thing my partner noticed, actually, when uh, when Donna and I first started coming together, I had always, I'd never been able to get to sleep, even from like late teenage, 16, 17, 18, and all through my 20s and very early part of my 30s. I had this thing, I think I kind of conditioned myself to this, that I could never go to sleep before midnight. No matter how tired I was, I would still have to watch them on Netflix or whatever. Come 12 o'clock, right, my, my mind could never even go to sleep. One of the things I noticed that after a separation was going through the divorce process and things like that was I could fall asleep anywhere at any time of the day, regardless of whether I'd had 12 hours sleep or not. You could sit me on the train, park bench, the sofa, and boom, I could just fall asleep. Um, getting back up again, was always quite <laughs> quite uh, quite a challenge, quite a struggle, um, and actually getting out of bed. But um, weight loss and weight gains, I put this in my article as well. I, I never knew this until I was doing a bit of research for the article, but um, men statistically suffer more from the, uh, weight fluctuations um, more rapidly than, than our female counterparts do through a, a divorce or separation. And again, I... I Personally, I feel that that's an impact from both what what's going on physically as well as emotionally, um, and from a mental health perspective of how we're coping with things, um, not necessarily in the right way, uh, things like that. Um, but what, what about yourself, Ben? What was it for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I've got lots to talk about, but just before I talk about what happened to me, I, I just want to pick up, up, Tom, on what you said about men not talking, you know. And I think it happens for women as well. We're very good at saying we're okay. We're very good at pushing it down and just pushing on with our day, with our week, with, with life. And, and I think men in particular, when you push it down, when you don't deal with it, like you say, when you replace that by drinking, overeating, partying hard, or whatever you want to do to mask those feelings, those, those feelings are still going to be there. And unless you get them out, this is when things like anxiety, panic attacks, and things to do with our body comes into play um, because the brain can only hold so much. And when it's literally full to the brim, that's when it starts showing up in our body. And that's when we get ill. And that's when we have that anxiety and panic attack. So I think, you know, for us as coaches, we always say to people, you must talk to someone, even if it's not us. Yep. Just having that one friend that you can rely on, that is your go-to person to be able to get everything out. Because I'm sure like like me, Tom, your feelings changed on a day-to-day basis. Some days you felt great. Some days you didn't want to get out of bed. Some days you wanted to reach for the ice cream. Some days you were depressed. You know, and I think everyone feels like that. You could have weeks where you're going along fine and then something will just hit you between the eyes and put you right back to the beginning again. Yeah. Uh, you know, it is really good to actually get those emotions out. And if you haven't got anyone to talk to, 
literally acknowledge that they are there and not push them down and be okay with thinking, do you know what? I don't feel great today. I feel really depressed. Actually just acknowledging them is one way of not pushing them down is just get them out in the open. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, de de definitely it's such a big, big thing. Um, I mean, I used to suffer from panic attacks in my twenties. Um, so they were not new to me. And after my second marriage breakdown, they come back full throttle. I was having them almost daily. Really? I was getting triggered daily. I was having panic attacks daily to the point I was in such a mode of trauma because I went through what people would term relationship trauma because I'd had both my um, exes cheat on me. I went into this whole kind of trauma state where I was having daily panic attacks. I didn't eat. I couldn't eat. I was so much... I don't know, I was so heightened. I went into what they call hypermobilization through fear. You either go into mobilization, which is what happened to me, or you go into immobilization. So I could not rest. My body was full of cortisol. I was on the go constantly. I couldn't sit down. I couldn't eat. Um, I couldn't sleep. Um, and I was in that state of fight or flight all the time. And when you're like that, for I was like that for at least six to nine months. Yeah. Um, I lost so much weight because I was on the go and because I wasn't eating properly. Um, oh gosh, I must have dropped three dress sizes at least. Put it all back on now though, you'll be pleased to know. Um, so yeah, I looked ill. I looked ill, I looked old, um, I looked totally, totally unwell. And you know, I got to a stage like you where I had one episode where I actually thought to myself, I don't want to be here people are going to be better off without me when you get to that stage that's when you know I should have been reaching out to people I didn't I internalized it all there was no one that I felt that I could talk to but when you get to that stage of I don't want to be here I can look back on now and that scares me that I was actually in that place um, because the next step to that is planning it and then the next step to that is doing it and I can totally empathise with people that feel that they have got nothing left. Because like you said, Tom, you were there. I've been there. It's, it's not a great feeling. No. And I think the, the people that actually, the, my two kids got me out of that, what I call that black hole. Um, because they were the reason I got up every day. They were the reason that I carried on. Because I actually thought to myself, they're better off with an unwell mother than a dead one. Yeah. And that's yeah was the bottom line um and I did talk to you a little bit before when I moved into my house after nine months after my marriage ended it was the best thing ever um but because my body had been on this hyper mobilization for so long I ended up in hospital I went to bed one night I'd been out with my friends the day before it was near Christmas we'd had a couple of drinks nothing too major I'd gone home I'd gone to bed about 12 um, within three hours, my body had shut down. I woke up in absolute agony. I couldn't move. I couldn't even get to the toilet. And I lay there thinking, that's it. I've gone and done it now. I would think I was 40, 45 at the time. And I thought, my life's over. No one's going to love me again. I'm going to be in a wheelchair. And, you know, just real much, you know, the pity just rained down on me. And I was taken to hospital and literally i just got pumped full of steroids just to enable my body to move again wow. it was the kind of the they said look you can go home because it was two days before christmas i said look i've got to be there for christmas i'm doing christmas dinner it's my kids first christmas with me in our new house i can't that miss pressure's it on you as well that pressure was on me. i thought no way am i being in in hospital over christmas so they basically said you know yes you can go home because i would started to be able to move a bit but you must rest I didn't really rest, but, you know, it gave me that chance to recover. You know, steroids are a wonderful thing. I was worried after that, that when they left my body, I would be back to square one. And that was a huge wake up call for me that actually I needed to slow down. I needed to change my habits. I needed to look after myself because yeah. I thought, you know what, this is a little warning here. And this is my body saying, this is what happens if you do this. So after that, you know, I did take that step back, but it's, it, you know, I would have kept on going. And it's yeah. taken probably a few years to get out of this kind of fight, fight or flight mode. 
so I don't want, you know, I want people listening to this, you know, you can and actually suffer from real major mental health problems by going through a separation and divorce. It can be far, far reaching. And I would say to anybody that if you feel that you want to end it all, there are people out there to help you. I'm not ashamed to say that I actually phoned up the Samaritans one night. Did you? Literally got that to that point where I had to speak to someone because I was quite frightened of what I was going to do. Um, and now wonderful, I cannot thank the the lady on the end of the phone enough for that for that hour that I was on the phone to her because yeah. she was able to, you know, not talk me down, just kind of put everything into perspective and just knowing that someone was at the end of the phone listening it was like oh they're listening i do matter so it, it was wonderful yeah you you got a very point a minute ago about when you say about one step is thinking about it the next step is planning mm -hmm. it and then obviously mm -hmm. that's what you're doing and it the, the other key word came up was frightening and i think i i didn't actually call the samaritans um or, or anybody else for me actually it was just that real like self-frightening like internal like yeah talk, like the internal voice talking to myself around right right so hey and even that just kind of that was enough to pardon French scared the shit out of me enough to go something's got to give something's got to change mm -hmm. um and like you say it is then about adapting those habits and stuff right well what can I do differently what can I do better than I've been doing what can I what do I need to stop doing mm -hmm. as well um, how do I need to start improving my mindset as well as me physically? So oh, I'm I'm not like a gym person or anything, but just getting out and walking even, um, bike ride, running, whatever it might be, but something there, you're connecting something positive physically to start helping you with the mindset as well, uh, and getting out there because there's so many studies out there and it's, it's obvious everyone knows it, but your mind and body are connected. Um, if you're going to, if you if one of them is in balance, the other one is going to be as well. Start following suit. So it's about what can you actually action start taking focus for to start impacting it positively. Like I say, it was just that experience of scaring myself enough to go, mm -hmm. oh right, I actually, do you know what? Horrible thought. Don't want to go about down that mm -hmm. path. And so I had pretty much, I, I pretty much would imagine most parents would say, I had the same thought process as you. Do you know what? My kids are better off having a version of me around mm -hmm. than none at all. Um, yeah. At which point my action plan was right. The action that I do need to take is now making myself the best version. So how do I do that? Um, I did go and see. I did seek outside help. Um, I went to. I went to a, a counselor, a traditional talk therapist. Um, she was amazing. I think I mentioned her before. Mm -hmm. um, and she was great. She helped me do a lot of background past experience stuff um and thought processes that were there and to get more of an understanding around things um i don't know about you and your experiences very much i think tell us in a second but for me i found that bit was great to a point and it really served a great purpose for me a great support resource it was then actually going off and deciding to do coaching and originally in all honesty my, my original game plan was go off and do business corporate coaching um i wasn't really going to do that i wasn't originally going to go and focus on uh helping divorcing and separating couples and families my original goal was actually i've worked in recruitment for 15 years i was actually going to go and help try and change the workplace well-being and workplace mental health um through business coaching um but it's through that training process that i started to also then learn more about me how i can process things differently how i can break down my goals and things like that uh, and actionable steps, little bite-sized chunks along the way to making my overall improvement. Um, and it was actually through that process that helped me deal with a lot more of the, I suppose, the unanswered questions or the, well, what do I do when this happens? Yeah. What happens when they meet someone else? What happens when there's mm -hmm. a, a, a step siblings? What happens if I bump into my ex-mother-in-law in the high street? <laughs> How, what am I going to do when this happens? And it's all those kind of, oh my God, big picture thinking, like everything going on at, at once, um, that maybe just break it down through the process of coaching to really understand what all my options were, what my choices were, yeah. what I could actually do about it, um, et cetera, and aligning it with like my values and my belief system and what, what I believe to be true and what I want, mm -hmm. how I want things to be, what I want it to look like, feel like at the end of it. Um, but yeah, it, it was really much, it was very much a wake up call from 
scaring myself about yeah I don't want to go I actually don't want to go that path and and finding a uh, finding an outlet to reach out to I mean I was very fortunate in honesty that um mental health professionals uh are kind of a thing in my family my sister's a child psychologist my mum's a bereavement counsellor she was a nurse for 25 30 plus years so for me it was actually always a case that there was it was it wasn't didn't have so much of the stigma that it does mm. um but that was a big piece around the article that i was writing the other week um was that this whole thought process of like big boys don't cry and man up which i hate that phrase and things like that um which aren't true uh, and it's about demystifying them and making people aware that actually you, you're not alone and it's not just you and there are people out there to support you um and, and to help you uh and that you're, you're not the first you won't be the last uh, it's about taking those steps so you go right I, I need some help with this mm -hmm. yeah d definitely I, you know you know when you said about the walking that was the main thing that i started to do when you're in that black hole literally the only way is up and i literally woke up the next day thinking do you know what i'm going to fight this I'm going to succeed in life. I deserve to be happy. I deserve to be successful. I deserve to be loved. And that's the fighting mentality that you can bring out of a really bad situation. And, you know, I used to park my car up because at that time I wasn't a, a divorce coach. I was still teaching and I was only teaching a couple of days a week. I park my car up and I just get out and I just walk. I wouldn't have a plan. I wouldn't have a map. And it just that process of putting one foot in front of the other just settled me it seemed to just ground me yeah. I mean there were so many days I was rushing to get back to pick my kids up thinking oh my gosh I'm never going to make it it was just a total escape for me I mean I still I'm a big walker now and I'll be up in the Peak District and I still use it as a grounding technique if I'm feeling a little bit anxious or feeling a bit panicky I would get my walking boots on and I will walk you know it's it's one of it has been proven it's one of the best things to help people with recovering from trauma, you know, panic attacks, any sort of mental health issues. Being outside in nature is a, is a huge healer. And the other thing that I did, Tom, I decided that, you know, been married for all this time, um, I was gonna take myself off on holiday on my own. Um, I thought, I know, I'll go on a yoga holiday to Mallorca on my own, don't know anyone, but that's what I'm gonna do. And I pushed myself and you know, it was the best thing that I ever did because I, I proved to myself that I could do it, that I could go abroad on my own with some like-minded people, two hours of yoga a day. And it got me then into loving yoga. And I, that's still something that I do, my meditation and I practice gratitude. And that's another thing that I put into my weekly, if not daily routine, just to help me with those feelings of stability. Because I think when you've been in a place where, where you have Tom as well, where you don't feel stable, you need something to anchor you. You need something to ground you. And walking and yoga is something that, that helps me to do that, that just keeps my body and my brain kind of working together. I mean, I know, Tom, that you do a lot of bike riding, don't you? Yeah. Not a road biker, more of a mountain biker. I like to go, I live near the field, so I like to go up and get really muddy and stuff. I'll tell you what else I used to, what I used to do. In fact, I still do it. Um, when I started going, getting out and walking, and like, I've we go out to like the Peak District places like that and dump in their business at the other. But I start to go out and start walking and trying to focus on, I suppose, finding my kind of um, better self, as it were. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that you said earlier on around like the awareness and acknowledgement of what it is that you're thinking and feeling and where you're at. And being mm -hmm. At first, before I even sought out the, uh, the, the help of that counsellor, there was one thing I started doing when I started walking, um, and it, it just popped into my head, and I just remembered it actually. Um, so that I was actually vocalising it before I even got to a point where I felt safe and comfortable to vocalise this with someone else. Mm -hmm. I must have looked a little bit crazy walking around the fields. <laughs> but I walk around and I go for a walk and I take like my iPhone and I put it on voice memo or dictaphone or whatever it's called these days. And I have my headphones in sometimes and I'd walk around and what was going on up here and what I was trying to process and to actually vocalise it before I can get to a point of vocalising with someone else. I vocalised it to the dictaphone and the voice memo on my phone. Um, just actually getting it out was, a, was initially a first step. So, right, okay, I can talk about this. And just a bit of a release as well, the feeling of getting it out. And, oh, I kind of dealt with that, um, or at least vocalising that. And then I also started um, not necessarily journaling, not like a dear diary type thing, but 
writing out my thoughts as well and not but not typing them but actually mm. handing out and getting those thoughts out so at least I had it out of my head to a degree and I could start to break it down and process a little bit more um, which was hugely beneficial in fact the, the, the dictaphone trick um, I actually started using <laughs> that, uh, developing things like my website my Instagrams things like that even for client sessions that I had coming up when I was first starting I've spoken to this client, I've had the discovery call, I know they're dealing with these type of aspects and I go out for a walk by myself and I just talk into the dictaphone because again I was vocalising it, right, what am I going to do, how can I help them, what can they be going through, what tips and tools and techniques, just vocalising it gave me kind of a, a process for kind of actioning it, uh, I found that really, really useful. That's good actually Tom because I did a lot of the journaling and again that's something that I will advise clients to do because it's when it's in your headspace you need to get it out. Like you say, either verbalise it um, or put it down on paper because when it's on paper or you've talked about it, it's not in your head. So I used to make notes daily on how I felt, what happened. You know, it could be based around anger that I was feeling, the shame I was feeling. And I'm sure you would agree, Tom. I, you know, two years ago, I couldn't have sat here and talked about what I'd been through. I couldn't have sat here and said that I was ready to end it all. And I can now because I've done the necessary work. I've dealt with it. I've dealt with the shame. I've dealt with the anger. I've dealt with the guilt. And I'm sure you were the same, Tom, that there was no way you could have spoken about it a few years ago when it was all happening. It, no, it's no. too raw, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is too raw. And I think one of the other things that you kind of touched on there as well, like with the, the shame and the guilt side, because that's something that I would never go and tell a complete stranger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't record and then <laughs> put out on the big wide world knowing that someday my kids and grandkids are going to be able to see this and stuff like that. But actually, it's, again, it's part of that process of it. really understanding and accepting who you are and where things are for you uh, and, and how to move forward. But again, it's those lessons that we've kind of gone through and learned that. And that, again, brings us all back on puzzles, doesn't it, to like working with someone that's a positive outlet for you. Um, I get people come to us on time that say, um, that what's coaching, how does it work, how is it different mm. to traditional talk therapies or, or, or counselling, um, are you just going to tell me what to do, are you going to give me advice, mm. and again it's not any of that, it's working with you to help you understand what's going to be right for you and look at all the job options and choices that are available to you, but it's about guiding you through that process and being that person that's come to you. Uh, and sometimes even just to have that that then I have some clients that just for the first five ten minutes just want to go rah, mm -hmm. rah, I've kind of got that out I've told someone it's out in the big wide world right what can I do about it what can I control what can't I control mm -hmm. what, what, can, what can I do to stop me from feeling like that again or yeah. from going down that path how do I recognize my triggers so I'm, if I know so a client last week was he said to us he went oh you've made me realize now I know what my triggers are for mm -hmm. my triggers so I'm two, I'm even out like another step back. So before I even know what my trigger is, I know what the trigger is for the trigger, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, he said, so actually I can see things coming from a mile down the road uh, and it's just helped me no end to go, oh, right, actually I can put a stop on there and I can deal with that and I can cope with that. Um, and I think, like, like we say, we're, we're the mind and the body are connected as well. If you're going down the rabbit hole of more mm -hmm. severe depressions, um, that can lead into, to, for some people, it can be even, you were saying before, kind of uh, about around traumas, um, where some people may be having certain, um, I suppose, conditions that, or uh, a situation that might be aligned to mild forms of PTSD as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. And again, you from a physical point of view, if you're not in the best physical space as well, that can then lead on to other things as well. Like we said before, if your diet is awful not looking after yourself and your mind's in the worst place as well and you're just consuming the wrong things that you can have onset of diabetes heart disease stroke so on and so forth and these are all it's disease it's a dis-ease in your body um that is coming through um from connection to to the mindset and the emotional side so it, it really is important to make sure that you, you get out there and find a support outlet that works for you it definitely I'm a big believer in that whole sort of mind body thing and and I think you're right Tom you know everyone's got triggers everyone's got those buttons that people can push and you know we've as coaches we know what our buttons are there's going to be some unknown ones but you know when you know what your buttons are when you know 
actually someone could push that button. It's knowing how to deal with it. It's knowing the tools to use to deal with it. And you, you know, you may be sitting there now thinking, oh my gosh, I'm having panic attacks every day. I feel depressed. I feel anger. You will get there. I mean, that's the reason why me and Tom do what we do because we've been there. We know what it feels like. And we've turned our life around. You know, we were having this conversation when we first met, weren't we, Tom, that, you know, we're in the, I'm the happiest that I've ever been. I'm, you know, the most driven and determined that person that I didn't even think I would be, you know, five years ago. If someone was to sort of say five years ago when I was going through, you know, you'd have this business, you'd be doing this, you'd be doing that. I literally, I would laugh at them and say, there is no way that I will have done all those things. So whenever I see a client, I say, you know, this is the time to, to make these huge changes, to turn your life around. I get quite excited for clients because I know that if they put the hard work in and the internal work needed that they are going to come out of you know the sessions or the block of sessions with me a completely different person yeah absolutely. and that to me is really exciting yeah I did one of my one of my favorite things throughout the uh, throughout the week working week or even at the weekend because we talking about this a minute ago as well won't we about um working at the weekend <laughs> one of my favorite <laughs> things is a whatsapp not just a full testimony or anything like that a whatsapp out or text out the blue, just a little message with, it might be a screenshot of whatever task it is that they've decided they want to complete, um, that they've got through or some actionable step or even better, the outcome from a situation that they've approached differently than they knew they would have before. And just those little messages uh, of like, going, oh, look what I've done, look what I've achieved, look, I've done it yeah. differently. And like, for me, that is one of, like, that is the biggest reward is actually seeing yeah. And I always, I just love going back to people and I'm like, well done, like, that's amazing, nice. And that, I love it when people always say to you, thank you so much, because I'm always like, you, you did the hard work. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. You, did, you did the work, not me. Um, what I did was just help you mm -hmm. decide where you want to go with it and how you want to go about mm -hmm. it. Um, but you did all the hard work, so like, kudos to you. Um, but yeah, I love, I love seeing those missions. No, no, no bigger reward than getting a, a, a WhatsApp pop up going, this has happened, worked out really well. Definitely. And, you know, it, again, like our role is to, to help people and, and support people. We can't do it for our clients. And that is the biggest stick, sticking point sometimes for us coaches, because if we have a client that is there with us, but they don't, they're not ready to take those steps, however small, um, they're not going to see that growth and progress. So it can be sometimes quite frustrating because, you know, when we have clients as coaches, we want to help them as much as we can. We want to make sure that they're getting as much out of the coaching sessions as possible. But if they're not in the right frame of mind to do it, they're not going to see the transformation. And I've got this little, you know, this little saying that I say, you know, small steps can lead to giant leaps. When you, once you start doing the little steps, however small, and that could be as simple as, like you say, getting up and going for a walk. Yeah. It could be as small as getting out of bed. Those small steps will, you know, it's like a domino effect. It just sets, sets off the next one and the next one. And before you know it, you're taking these huge leaps that you never thought that you would take. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. Yeah. Oh, Mental health is a big, all tied up in all of that. And I did actually want to talk to Tom, and it is a bit of a contentious issue. I get a lot of clients asking me, should I take antidepressants? Do you, do you get the same? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Quite a lot. I think, again, because I think, and it's just personal opinion, I think the way that it, the, the issue to resolve an issue these days, portrayed media-wise TV programmes, whatever it might be, is that if someone's going through that, they go to the doctor and et cetera. And it, there is, a, again, there's a time and a place to deal with that. Mm -hmm. chemical imbalance um to say but it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the be on end or it doesn't have to be yeah. just go to um as well and yeah i think sometimes all too often people can go to what feels like the easier option or the easier mm -hmm. reach when actually it's not necessarily the best thing for you either short term yet alone longer term as well so yeah, yeah I, I do get that quite a lot yes um that's, that's one thing that comes up it, it is a hard one because, you know, we're not medically trained and, you know, we've all got our different opinions. And I always take the stance, do you know what, if you feel you need them, that's up to you. I mean, my personal um, experience was I never took them because I was very much, I'm going to try and do this without. 
yes. because I, I'm already on medication for a different underlying health problem. So I thought, do you know what? I don't want to put more things into my body on top of what I already take. Yeah. And I was very much, you know what? I want to fight this myself. I want to see how strong I am. I want to push myself. But I totally get why people will go to their doctor and say, look, I can't cope. And, you know, they seeing it as a short term fix is better than seeing it as a long term um, treatment or answer. Yeah. And like you, I'd always say to people as well, like if, that, if that's the course of action you want to take, it's fine. And I can be support you if that's your, your choice. What I would do if people say, right, for, for, for what purpose? What's what, mm -hmm. why? What's this trying to serve? And then we can start to work it backwards and say, okay, well, what other options are there? What other choices and what can, what else could you do mm -hmm. that could impact the current situation and shift that for you? Um, is that your diet? Is it your exercise? Is it a million and one other things um, that maybe, like you say, starts to help shift those little those baby steps? As it yeah. Um, because like you say, like it's, you know, just get up and go, right, I'm going to go run a marathon today. Like you have to train and work up to that and if you haven't i'm just using the analogy but if you've never done any form of exercise before or any running you're not going to do that so what do you do what do you start break it down do you know something like couch to five couch to five k whatever yeah. it is to build that up and then uh, actually i've had a client that's done that recently he's in his 60s and wanted to get a bit more active so he did Couch to 5k and he hit five, wanted to hit 5k and then went, right what's next and now he's doing 10k yeah. and now he wants to build up and do a half marathon and so on and so forth but again it was just use that analogy because all too often like clients they don't even realize once they've got further down their road farther further on their path that they actually could take a step back and just look back down the road and go god look how far i've come <laughs> yeah. look, look where i was and how the hell did each of those little incremental changes make such an impact on where I am now? Yeah, it's definitely, that's what it's all about. I mean, I don't like to really reflect on where I was then. Like you say, we can talk about it now. I can talk about it without getting triggered or without feeling too, too much. However, I don't like to dwell on it too much because actually it's all about what we're doing now, where we've got to, what's the next thing. Um, and I think you're right with antidepressants. You know, if someone's not sleeping, or they're struggling with sleeping before maybe you go to the doctor and say, look, I'm not sleeping. I need some sleeping pills. I used to listen to those apps where it's the rain. Have you heard of those like car yeah. maps? Yeah. Where you, I'd fall asleep listening to like pounding rain or waves or, or sometimes even an audio book. I think there's some great apps out there to help you sleep. You know, there's some great meditation apps. There's some great um, like quote apps for you to get your sort of daily quotes. Um, I don't know whether you used any of those, did you, Tom? Uh, I have used them before, but not to a great degree. By that time, I think I've figured my sleep pattern out. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, like you say, I mean, there was a there was a client not too long ago. Um, he said the same thing. He's like, I, I just can't sleep. I can never get to sleep until silly o'clock in the morning. I have very broken sleep. It's not a good sleep. I'm not mm. rested at all. And he kind of got into a bit of this vicious cycle. Yeah. Uh, and he said he was going to go and get sleeping tablets. I said, okay, okay great. Look, if that's what you feel is going to serve you, then fantastic. It's like, but actually, why not? Let's look at why you're not sleeping, what's behind it. So, and it was things too much alcohol, um, no exercise, poor diet, um, very little uh, uh, personal, professional, recreational focus. Mm -hmm. um, something to really concentrate on and, and get involved with. It was just in this kind of constant cycle. Um, so once he started to shift those and kept a consumption diary and then started to reduce his drinking and then start to exercise and start to focus on some some passions and some hobbies um, uh, as well as in a, a, a work situation. And to have a, a bit of a mix of all these other things, he then started to fill up his day and used up his energy levels and he started eating better and things like that. He actually was then able to start sleeping better, which again then in, impacted and helped reduce things around panic attacks he was having, the anxiety levels that were kicking up, everything else that was going on for him emotionally uh, and helped him really gain perspective. So, Yeah, easy. definitely. And another thing I would say to my clients, if you're not sleeping, it's generally because you're overthinking. You've got the thoughts on the hamster wheel and you can't get rid of them. I'm, I'm a big advocate of brain dumping it, run it down. I still do it now. I'm an avid list maker, I've got lists everywhere. So I would say to clients, you know, if you can't sleep because you've got questions in your head or you've just got words, put it on paper because when it's on paper, you can then say to yourself, 
on paper. It doesn't have to be in my head. It will still be there in the morning. And that just frees your brain up enough to maybe help you relax. Um, so that's another great thing that worked for me. And I'll pass that on to clients. There's so many different little tricks and tips that we will get our clients to do. Um, another thing I used to do, and I'm, I'm missing it at the moment, is swimming. I used to pound up and down the swimming pool weekly. And it would get out all of my anger, all of my frustration, because when you've got that all inside of you, that emotional energy, it has to go somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what? It's funny you say that because um, my dad, I can kill you for saying this now, he goes <laughs> to like Monday to Friday, he goes every day because he's retired. Um, and every day he, he goes to the, the, this local spark or spark thing um, and he swims a lot and then spends the rest of it in the hot tub jacuzzi or whatever, chilling in. Um, <laughs> and obviously he's and I'm very happy together but actually it's lockdown that caused the issue because obviously it's closed and then very very quickly started to notice just either from on the phone to him on a family quiz on zoom talking to mum whatever seeing how that was impacting because he was worked up he was pent up he was angry yeah. he was getting the, just the things that normally wouldn't get to him really getting to him because he doesn't have that out there so if you think yeah. about it flipping it around the other way if you're in the middle of something mm -hmm. like a separation or in the middle of court hearings and things like that um and you're not getting that energy out somewhere like swimming for example mm -hmm. and things like that where do you think that energy goes why do you think that builds up in you and you end up having mm -hmm. these panic attacks anxiety attacks respiratory issues yeah. like it all goes somewhere and like you said earlier on um the brain can only take so much um yeah. and eventually it will just go okay shut down now um and then and then that happens definitely and, and you know on top of that there's things you can have like memory loss and things like that i went through i know they call it like mum fog when people are pregnant and things like that but i literally had um separation fog i didn't i couldn't remember things i was getting in a right muddle with things my memory was so bad that's why i used to write so many different lists so i didn't forget anything you know there's all that that people don't think about retrieval of knowledge as well i used to sit there and think how do i spell and it was like <laughs> why do i not know that you know it can affect so many parts of your brain that you know, I used to have days, I don't know whether this happened to you, Tom, I'd get up in the morning and some days I couldn't even walk in a straight line. It'd be like I'd been drinking the night before and I hadn't. I'd be like weaving because my body couldn't remember how to walk in a straight line. I was that bad. See, I, I, didn't, I didn't get that. I'll tell you what I did have. Um, I got very forgetful, like you said. Mm. Um, didn't fit me kind of walking, but I'm quite an organized person generally speaking mm -hmm. um so i always put my car keys my wallet my watch and gubbins i usually have on my person mm -hmm. when i go out car keys whatever they all go in the same drawer I'm in the dresser in the kitchen um and it sounds really silly but i used to get really forgetful like i would i'd be constantly going up and down the stairs and going from room to room and then forgetting why i was there and then i i just completely i became completely unorganized which again, it then had a lead on effect to me then getting worked up about stuff, even yeah, getting yeah. angry about stuff, um, or even then worrying that I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, again, I then had to kind of just work it back, figure out where right, get, make sure you get back into a routine set of process, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That sounds so simple. And that, that's the other thing, I don't know if you get this from clients quite a lot, is Sometimes they come back to us either at the end of the session, middle of the session, sometimes the following week, whatever it might be, and go, that thing that we were talking about, and at the time I, I, I was thinking, that's really simple. It's yeah. Really, really <laughs> obvious. Why are you saying that? Or why are you thinking that? Or what was that suggestion? Like, this is really, and they don't even realize sometimes it's those simple, basic tasks sometimes that can also set that trigger. Um, and I don't know if you ever get that where people just go, what? Well, that's really simple. It's like common sense, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, totally. I always say to clients, like, I'm telling you this because sometimes you need to know, and it is common sense. However, do you do A, B, and C? And they will look at you as if say, well, yeah, I do. And then they'll sit and think and go, hmm, but I've not thought of it like that. So sometimes, it, you know, we do have to be quite literal with clients because when you're in the thick of it, you know, mental health problems, and you know work and life you just need someone to to strip everything back 
and say, right, let's just look where you are. And a big part of, you know, is, is accepting where you are. Yes, you're going to go through a stage where your mental health is going to take a knock. Um, regardless of whose fault it was, how it ended, whether it was a joint decision, it's going to rear its head. And it's, it's being okay with that. It's being able to say, do you know what? This is what's happening to me and not push it down and acknowledge it and accept it and, and just be okay with being where you are at that moment and what I call treading water until, you are, until yeah. you're ready yeah. and strong enough to, to make these steps. I think that's a really good point, to be fair, because I think that even though mental health, well-being, whatever you want to call it, is less taboo these days and is more talked about, it's in the media and especially you know, yeah. lockdown as well, um, you, you, uh, what you're saying there around people should expect do anticipate that you are going to be impacted and affected mm -hmm. I would be very surprised if a client wasn't in some way or some form or even non-clients people that I never do um or never see yeah, I would, it would astonish me if people weren't affected in some way shape or form and again that's the whole point it's okay to, it's okay not to be okay not to kind of use that hashtag yeah. It is, yeah it is okay not to be okay like everybody struggles with this in their own way uh, and reacts to it differently and it affects people differently mm -hmm. just giving yourself a bit of space to acknowledge that actually you are okay and it is okay to to, to feel like this and there's going to be some ups and downs um but then seeking what's the best way through this um and not letting it consume you uh, it, it yeah is, it, definitely I think you're totally right you know there's so much in the media now you know it's okay for us as coaches to say well this is what we did I think there's an expectation that you've got to get your work-life balance sorted you've got to get your mental health sorted. you've got to go out and do yoga or walking uh, yeah I think there is this huge expectation and I think it's finding out what works for you um, and what's working for your mental health. It won't necessarily be yoga or walking or swimming or, or cycling. It could be just sitting and reading a book. It might be just taking the dog for a walk. It could be so, so simple. I don't want, you know, people listening to this thinking they've got to go out now and, and book a yoga class or they've got to start doing meditation or swimming. Um, that, that's not the case. Um, it's like I say, it's just finding what works for you. And you will find something that you will become passionate about and it helps you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. All right, well, I suppose that's all we've got time for this week because you've, uh, <laughs> you've, got, you've got store running last week. You I have, got... yes. I have on a Monday. Um, yeah, but, you know. Are people. <laughs> <laughs> we are normal people, yeah. God, you know, my son will say what's for tea as soon as I see him. So I have to have a mental note of what I'm going to be cooking for tea later. I usually go and do my, what I call my big shop on a Monday morning and then catch up with clients and a bit of work. So, so yeah, it's a normal Monday for me, but actually doing these podcasts, and I know we generally won't be posting them till the weekend. I think it's a great start to the week. Yeah. You know, it, it kind of gets me focused. And, and I think, you know, we could talk about mental health forever and a day. I think maybe we could do some follow up ones. Um, Get some key speakers on here for you all as well. For definitely. You know, plenty of them. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we should probably do a little bit of a sign off then, guys. Well, look, yeah. Thank you, thank you everyone for watching uh, again and coming to view this. Um, if you are struggling, or even if you. If you don't know if you're struggling um, and you want to try and figure a few things out, you want to get your head around it. Um, at the end of the video, as always, uh, uh, Faze and my contact team will be popping up. Post us a comment, email us and contact us directly if you've got a question or if you want to reach out. We say this every time that we pay. We both offer a completely free consultation discovery call. So give us a call and find out what it's all about and see how we can help you. Um, and if there are other resources that we think would be better suited to you as well, we can also sign up and put in the right direction. Uh, all I will say is that I implore you to do reach out to someone and do speak to anybody. It doesn't necessarily have to be myself or Faye, uh, but please do reach out for that support. Definitely. And, you know, I hope you're all enjoying listening to these and it's something that we're going to continue. So if you said before, if there's anything you want us to talk about, drop us a line. Um, anything you particularly want a question answering, just drop us the question and we will do our best um, to answer it. We're not saying we have all the answers. As we've just said, we're both human. 
Um, we're all gonna, still gonna make mistakes, but we will try and do that for you as much as we know how. Um, because we'll that's what we're here for. It, find the answer thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we will definitely help you find the answer. And um, we may not have the answers, but you know, it's all about you um coming on this journey with us really and and especially if you're going through a breakup separation or divorce at this time especially during lockdown it's just so much harder you know if i think back tom to if i was doing my breakup during lockdown it would have been so much harder so yeah. i take my hats off to you all if this is what you're going through during lockdown yeah absolutely i couldn't imagine doing this through through a lockdown so uh, yeah but no, let's say do reach out i'll, I'll uh, contact info will be coming up towards the end of the video and we'll see you all next week for I think what have we got next week next week we're Christmas, doing I think preparing for Christmas yes so yeah cool that'll be an interesting one I'll get some tinsel around the chair <laughs> oh I've got to get my Christmas jumper out Tom that's a great yeah. idea should do we that. could have Christmas jumpers couldn't we I don't even know whether I've got one I'm going to have to have a look I must have one somewhere I, I think the one I've got might be slightly too offensive for a, uh, for a podcast <laughs> 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 I'll find another one. But yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye.